Hej, hej. Det här kommer att hållas på engelska, så alla vet. Um, hello and welcome, and welcome to all of you joining online uh, to this conversation with uh, Natalia Gozak from EcoAction, um, Ukraine's largest environmental organization. Um, my name is Marie Schankvist Satnik, and I'm a climate policy advisor at Naturskyddsföreningen, SSNC. And I would like to give a warm welcome to Natalia for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much. And you are the executive director for EcoAction, uh, based in Kiev. And you have over 15 years of experience working with environmental issues. And EcoAction is a long-term partner of Naturskyddsföreningen. Um, and impressively, the organization has continued its work since Russia's invasion in February. At times with employees spread out across Ukraine and abroad. But now um, I understand that most of you are back in Kiev, um, although that might change quickly. Uh, so the focus of the organization's advocacy work has changed a bit over the course of the war to also reflect the issues caused by the war and the issues behind the war. Um, so um, Natalia will tell us a bit more about this. So I hope there will be time for a bit of questions at the end, but let's see. So uh, Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, dear colleagues. I hope you could hear me. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Our, we really work with our partners for years. And, uh, and now I would like briefly to uh, say a few words about situation in Ukraine now and with the focus on environmental impacts of uh, war and Russian invasion, uh, green post-war recovery and how it affected our uh, organization. Then I would be happy to hear questions, if any, um, uh, a bit later. Um, so, situation. As you may know, uh, the war is, has started in 2014, more than eight years ago. And uh, from February 24th, uh, the full-scale invasion of Russia to Ukraine uh, is in place. But uh, here you could see our team of uh, more than uh, 30 staff members happily celebrating a uh, new year in our office at December 2021. And uh, out of these uh, four, uh, 30 staff members, now we have uh, two of them in army, um, three people left because of the new dramatic situation um, in family life and um, in March uh, just four of them stayed in Kiev. They were forced, uh, all of us were forced to leave Kiev, capital of Ukraine, very quickly and uh, around one third of the team appeared abroad. Uh, all others dispersed all over the country. And now, uh, for today, uh, most of people are coming back, but still some of them stay abroad. And this is the picture of how the uh, all society are more or less doing now. Uh, sorry. So here are the numbers, which are not uh, uh, really reflecting. It's, it's hard to understand um, how it is now looking at those numbers, but if very briefly, we are talking about um, millions of Ukrainians who were forced to leave their uh, homes, to, mostly to EU. More than seven millions became refugees, considering that the overall population is around 40 million. Tens of thousands of uh, people definitely died. The statistics is still not clear at this moment. Uh, cities heavily destroyed, infrastructure damages uh, are in place, and overall economic uh, decline and drop of Ukrainian uh, GDP is predicted for 30-50%. This is amazing numbers. 
calculation for the damage is also in progress and there are different uh, numbers are now available but we uh, usually uh, speak about uh, 100,000 billions needed uh, to cover the damage uh, as it is now and here is uh, very uh, shortly the picture of uh, situation on the front line you could see in uh, green the territories liberated uh, from February, in blue liberated during last few weeks, and red and orange uh, these territories of Ukraine which are occupied um, either from 2014 or from February. Um, situation is changing quickly, so we, we usually follow up in a life. Uh, um, life mode but uh, as for march it was 20 percent of the whole territory of the country and uh, just uh, finalizing this overview block i would um, like to for you to have a look on this uh, um, on these words because words really matter and uh, sometimes it's not uh, really clear what and how um, in, and does it matter but uh, when we as uh, ukrainian civil society as ukrainians are inside all this uh, um, the war and this uh, um, unbelievable situation for 21st century for, for us it really matters so uh, i would not uh, advice and I would ask you not to use words as conflict or crisis, especially Ukrainian crisis, and, but rather focus on the reason and uh, on the actor which is actually, uh, um, which is the reason of the situation, the Russia, it's Russian's invasion, it's the uh, Russia's war against Ukraine and we cannot call this situation, crisis of conflict. This is already full-scale war. Uh, the second block is uh, who is guilty, actually. And rather often we see in uh, uh, foreign media position that Putin's war, this is the president who is guilty, or this is Russian's officials uh, are only responsible. I would like to pay your attention on this difference. With, and uh, we see that all Russians are responsible and some of them are guilty. Uh, it's really not just officials or Putin's war because it's not him uh, launching the missiles or it's not him uh, um, uh, communicating propaganda from TV channels. And, um, there are much more people involved, and those who are involved directly, they are definitely guilty. But uh, when we talk about other people uh, in Russia, they are responsible. You could imagine a situation when um, you find a baby on your doorstep one day. You could be definitely not guilty in this situation, but you are responsible to solve it. This, this is the difference I would like to um, point your attention. And definitely, we cannot, uh, this was especially important in the first months, that we cannot speak that we need peace. The peace could uh, be um, reached in uh, mere days, as soon as Ukraine says, okay, we give up our territory, we give up our freedom and uh, democracy. Um, that's why we need uh, victory, and that's the context we are living in. So, uh, sorry, environmental impacts of war. This is uh, the second block. I wanted to uh, say a few words. This is how it looked like when the missiles are um, launched uh, into some fuel deposit. We, uh, our NGO, Eco Action, are tracking and damages and impacts of the, to, to the environment. And now we have more than 500 cases. Um, definitely the high, the most uh, 
uh, risky and definitely the highest risks are around nuclear uh, power plants and nuclear stations. From the uh, February Chernobyl power plant, nuclear power plant, um, which is not operating now, was occupied and Saporizhia nuclear power plant stay occupied to now. These are some of the modeling of possible um, consequences if the um, missiles could damage the reactor. But definitely the, it's very much dependent on the uh, multiple factors. But uh, definitely nuclear risks are the absolutely number one when we talk about impact on the environment and health, not only of Ukraine, Ukrainian citizens, but on the whole Europe. Um, our analysis for the very first months of uh, this war showed that the damage to industrial facilities definitely the highest. Um, because uh, in the south and east of Ukraine are heavily industrialized, and that's why all the damage results in a heavy uh, contamination of the environment. Here is uh, how it looks when the coal mine is filled with unpumped water. This uh, consequence for the war to the environment is not very well known, but it leads to the um, contamination of drinking water in the whole areas, and it became um, not possible for local people to use the drinking water. And uh, we expect that due to the uh, such events, at least at four new coal mines, and the Donetsk uh, region territories would be affected with these water problems. Biodiversity damage is definitely one more of uh, these consequences, and uh, our partner NGO calculated at least 20 uh, species which are at risk of total um, extinction only because of this. Uh, um, the, the war in these areas. And agriculture. You could see on the left picture the one square kilometers of the agriculture land, uh, which is so heavily stuck with missiles that uh, experts say it contains more than 50 tons of iron only and multiple other uh, contamination, uh, uh, contamination with other uh, heavy metals and chemicals. Uh, this is just one side of the story and uh, affecting large farmers and small farmers, which you could see on the uh, right uh, picture, have to adapt to the situation and uh, using the land they have, even contaminated with the military equipment, to grow the food. And so what we as a environmental NGOs has been doing before and are doing now, we used to focus on climate, on energy and industry, uh, environmental aspects, doing a lot of uh, open street actions and advocacy work, as you could see our activity here. But after February, uh, open street actions are not possible to be implemented in Ukraine and our work was limited to the monitoring of environmental crimes, on the pushing of fossil fuels embargo for Russian fossil fuels, and uh, um, um, yeah, and post-war reconstruction. Sorry. Um, about environmental crimes, I've already mentioned, and here you could just for general understanding have a look on uh, the um, why sanctions on fossil fuels matter and that uh, shows the structure of Russian exports and you could see that 40% of federal budget revenues are formed by fossils. That's why um, European sanctions and the um, limitation of exports so much important as well as the possibility for Ukraine to export agriculture products. Um, yeah, just <laughs> the last block about the uh, green reconstruction. 
uh, we are sure that Ukraine will win in this war sooner or later. And after that, uh, the post-war reconstruction of the country have to be in place. As environmental uh, civil society, we believe that green reconstruction as a sustainable reconstruction using best available technologies and practices, this is the way how to return refugees back to the country, how to um, restore economy and ensure that future generations uh, have a chance to prosper. And together with more than 50 NGOs, we developed a set of the green reconstruction principles, uh, which you could see here, uh, focusing on the sustainability and climate policy and green economy principles to be uh, integrated throughout all reconstruction process. And final example. You could see here the uh, solar panels uh, affected by a missile strike. And here some of the panels are destroyed. But as soon as the workers uh, fix uh, and remove the destroyed elements, the whole um, plant would continue work. And imagine here the nuclear power plant. Such strike would end to the a uh, real catastrophe. And, um, uh, this war show, showed that renewables are much more resistant and um, this is uh, the way how uh, could be energy system operated in such unsure environment. Uh, the, sorry, was, Natalia, uh, I'm really sorry. I all. think our time is up, but thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks to you would be, uh, if any questions, I would be happy to answer, if any. Yeah, feel free to send questions if you have, and then to Swedish, to Naturskyddsföreningen, <laughs> Maria Schankvist, and then I will send them on to Natalia. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia.